2001 Space Odyssey is an epic film. My younger teenage brothers and I had heard the movie was trippy. So why not drop some acid and make it trippier? <laughs> My visiting cousins from LA supplied the acid tabs and the boys were getting high in the back of the station wagon. I was at the wheel, 16 years old, driving to San Jose's new Space Age Century 21 theater. I was straight. I had no idea about the acid. In summer 1968, the movie had been out a couple of months, but we didn't know or care that it was almost three hours long. We were there for the floating baby, the apes, and for me, actor Keir Dulay. His <laughs> penetrating eyes. His, he crushed as a spaceman, the original space oddity. A ways into the movie, my brother Steve stood up and slow motion stepped over people's knees to get to the aisle. What's up with him? My cousin snickered. I knew something was wrong. I went from watching a scene of bone-bashing apes and the floating baby to witnessing my brother hanging on a wall of urinals. When he saw me, he shouted out the floor was heaving. He sucked in air and pulled at his teeth, claiming they were coated with aluminum foil. <laughs> he clamped his jaw and cringed. He said it was torture. He wanted to go home, but made me promise not to tell mom and dad. Later that night at 3 a.m., Steve stood by my bed. He was crying. Go get dad. I think I'm dying. As a result, we had to go as a family to a counselor. <laughs> we had to buy this shrink book, I'm okay, you're okay. <laughs> it was all about how we saw the world. On one of the early pages in the book, there was a drawing of a rectangular table with something called life positions. Dr. Beale wanted me to pick the one that best explained me today. I could write it on an index card. A smart person would have written, I'm okay, you're okay. <laughs> to get the hell out of there as soon as possible. <laughs> My dad stared at his lap and Steve kept running his fingers through his hair. I wrote, I'm okay, you're not okay. <laughs> the counselor wanted us to figure out who in our family was a rescuer, who was the hider. Who was the scapegoat? Back in my brother's room, we'd talk. We had our own labels. Dad was the drunk. Mom was the liar. Truthfully though, I was afraid of Steve. He was the mean one. He'd lock me out of the bathroom, rifle through my personal things. He read aloud from my diary. He could be jealous and controlling. When my two-year-old sister was still in her high chair, he threw black pepper in her eyes. The focus was on Steve, why he was acting up. Not the counselor, not my dad or mom, talked about the big pink elephant in the room, dad's drinking. When I turned 17 and got accepted to the university, Steve wrote me a three-page letter. He didn't want me to leave. He'd have no one to talk to, and he knew he was messed up. He was having flashbacks from the acid. He really had been the one who early on had called out my dad on his drinking and my mom for covering for dad. He thanked me for driving around and listening to him in the car. He said he was lucky to have me as his sister. I cried when I left. I wanted to feel so happy and free that I was about to start my life. Inside, I felt different. My brother was sick. His brain wasn't working right, and I didn't know how to fix it. Could one acid trip really derail or damage a brain for good? I could see that we approach things differently. My way was to go, push forward. His to stay with a familiar. But I also knew our hearts hurt the same. Every time I came home for break and would then leave to go back to school, I felt a sad pull, like I ought to be there. But in tears, I'd close the door dragging my suitcase of guilt and worry. Five years went by when finally after completing a degree in student teaching, I moved back home to the Bay Area. I was 22 and broke. 
That was the summer that my brain hijacked my body. One part of my brain was telling me that moving home was a step backward. I'd be sleeping in my childhood bedroom with the pink walls and the white furniture. Worse than the bedroom was the reality my parents were letting Steve, now 20, hole up in the next bedroom where he'd been since high school. Steve was still not okay. He was obsessed with dad drinking, but didn't mind that my father was supporting him. He argued he couldn't keep his job as an orderly at the hospital because he had to stay up nights writing songs that he recorded on tapes. When Paul McCartney would receive the tapes via Capitol Records, he would be sure to help Steve cut an album and get rich. Another part of my brain told me it was only temporary, this living back at home within the triangle of my brother and my parents. I could block out their insanity, stick with a high of having finished college, keep busy with applying for that ultimate first teaching job. But by midsummer, a new nagging worry arrived. What if I didn't get hired for that teaching job? I secretly worried that Steve wasn't the only one having a crisis in confidence. One night, I escaped the house and went on a movie date with a boyfriend who'd come back in town. It felt good to be back, get away from reality, to be in that same familiar theater again. I'd always liked that movie theater, the smell of popcorn embedded in the felt seats. The darkness felt friendly because soon my eyes would adjust and I could see the people in neat rows feel my friend's warmth nearby. Suddenly, I became aware, though, of myself trying to watch a movie. But then I wasn't. I no longer felt like I was in my body. I couldn't feel my hands. I uncrossed my arms. I felt trapped like a wild fox in a garage with a cement floor and dark walls. Thoughts began rushing. My heart pounded and with a cotton mouth and numb lips, I couldn't swallow. I slipped by my boyfriend telling him I felt weird. The lobby was empty. In the bathroom, spots seemed to be strobing across my line of vision. I wet a paper towel and pressed it to my eyes. I don't remember us driving home. The house was dark and quiet. My parents were out at a dinner function with medical colleagues. The kitchen, in the kitchen, I called my dad's beeper. I needed my dad, not drunk dad, but dad the doctor who would know what to do. Dad called back and said he wasn't leaving right away. I pleaded something was really wrong with me. He didn't come, not for hours. When he finally got home and sat by my bed, I lay there breathing in the scotch and cigarettes. The next day, they made an appointment for me to see a therapist. I'd have to wait a few days. I tried to think my way out of what must be this temporary condition. I'd taken several psychology courses at the university. I'd even taken physiological psychology, the actual science of the brain and nervous system. I still had my textbooks, so I leafed through them, rereading favorite parts about scientists discovering one brain hemisphere could take over for the other if a part was injured or diseased. The brain could adapt. I knew science would save me. My thoughts, though, were invaded by movies, people having breakdowns, movies that both fascinated and scared the hell out of me. Movies like Three Faces of Eve, about a woman with multiple personalities, and ordinary people about an accidental death that triggers a suicide attempt. Both had won Academy Awards and were wildly popular. I'd liked them at the time, but now I felt scared. I didn't buy cliche scenes in Woody Allen films where intellectual New Yorkers at dinner parties talked about therapists like they were their best friends. Entertainment magazines showed hipster LA writers and actors mingling with celebrity therapists, Dr. Joyce Brothers sitting poolside at the cocktail party. There was nothing fun or hip about how I was feeling. If I could climb back up to a new normal or feel fine at a party. I landed back in the office of the therapist, Dr. Beale, the guy who saw my family about Steve. 
I told him about feeling out of my body and the waves of shivering and racing thoughts that came out of nowhere. I feared going back to a movie theater. I dreaded the dark and fighting to let my body go. He took notes on a yellow legal pad. He told me I didn't have to worry about a straight jacket or Agnew State Mental Hospital. Come back next week. Dr. Beale didn't give a name to my episodes, but I wasn't going to die, nor did I need pills. He seemed more interested in what led up to the event and what choices I was weighing and how those choices made me feel. That fall, I took a job in a nearby community college that had started up a writing program for vets returning from the Vietnam War. With the income, I rented a studio down the road from the college and bought my first set of dishes. I set up my favorite books and albums in a pine bookcase across from the pull-out bed. I'd stare at that bookcase, happy it was all mine. Through counseling, I found out the studies done on alcoholic families showed that adult children were prone to what later they termed panic attacks. I did cognitive training, self-talk, and built courage ladders to get my confidence back in places where I'd had these attacks. Knowledge is powerful, but I kept having episodes. A cluster of stresses would make me feel out of control and take me down. I couldn't predict when and where. Into my 30s, I'd have them once or twice a year. One time I had one on a jet. Another time in a shopping mall. I was in a cooking store just looking at a recipe and a cookbook. Big stresses with family could set me off. Steve continues to suffer from mental illness, pushing family and help away. Just this month, he was evicted from a studio apartment where he's lived alone for the past decade. It's been quite a few years since I've had the tidal wave of symptoms I experienced back in that movie theater in 1974. Recently, I felt like I might have a panic attack. I was getting that out of body, numb sensation, mouth dry swallowing hard. Where am I? Where am I? I'm here, taking some deep breaths, staying in my body, my home. Give it up for Vamp Board, Sassuiel Board President Nancy Carey.